Hi, my name is Tariq Adar, and today we'll be reviewing, uh, we'll be doing a very rapid review of clinical biochemistry cases. This is going to be a relatively long lecture, even though it says rapid review, because we're covering virtually all of the things that you can be tested on for the USMLE. All right, just a couple things I want to point out on this slide. Just the first step, which is going to be citrate synthase, acetyl CoA, and oxal acetate come together to form citrate. Okay, and then there's a couple of steps that are called redox steps in the tricyclic acid cycle. So something is oxidized and something is reduced. And 99% of the time, what's reduced is going to be NAD into NADH. So notice all the dehydrogenase reactions, except for this one, and I'll explain why in a second. All of these dehydrogenase reactions will are rate limiting in a sense. Um, particularly, so these are the three rate limiting steps, citrate synthase, because that's the first step, so that's always going to be regulated, and then isocitrate dehydrogenase and alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. Um, these are all regulated redox reactions. But in the redox reaction, so notice here, isocitrate gets oxidized in the alpha-ketoglutarate. What gets reduced? NAD becomes NADH. Alpha-ketoglutarate gets oxidized into succinyl COA. What does it become? What does NAD become? NADH. Malate is oxidized into oxal acetate. What does it become? What does NAD become? NADH. And those NADHs go on to for aerobic metabolism. So these are going to be what generate energy in the electron transport chain. That's why this is important. All right, there's also intermediate. Each of these can become a different molecule and participate in other reactions. Um, the reason why this doesn't have an NADH uh, associated with it, because what's reduced is the carbon itself. Notice here you have single bonds and here you have double bonds. This is a reducing bond. So it's more of an intrinsic redox reaction. Um, all right, and you do have the Q cycle, so this gets reduced as well. So that's why you don't have NADH formed here. All right, but here you do, because what's being reduced is the NAD, not the carbon chain itself. All right, you know, and it's occurring in the mitochondrial matrix. Um, so what's the first step going to be inhibited by? Anything that says, because what's the goal of tricyclic acid cycle? to make more energy and to make these intermediates. So what's going to inhibit this process? More energy or the intermediates. And that's going to mean NADH, which generates energy in the electron transport chain. That's going to inhibit citrate synthase. ATP, which is literal energy, is going to inhibit citrate synthase. This downstream metabolites like xenyl CoA, that will inhibit the citrate synthase. And citrate itself will inhibit citrate synthase. All right, and what activates it? Low energy, so ADP. Isocitrate dehydrogenase, same idea. Inhibited by high energy as ATP and NADH, activated by low energy like ADP. Alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, inhibited by ATP, GTP, and NADH, the energy enzymes, or its immediate uh, downstream products of xenyl COA. You can read this at your own leisure if you want to pause real quick. I'm not going to emphasize too much on it. Just want to point out that NADH acts at complex 1, FADH2 acts at complex 2, and you get more energy when NADH is uh, the source of the electrons, just because it, there's more reactions. Notice here there's a hydrogen that's released, and here there isn't, and that's the reason why. All right, and then those hydrogens are going to build up, and they're going to come through here. Cyanide will act at complex 4, so that's something you, you might need to know. Um, complex 4 is the final transfer. Cyanide binds to the iron here and prevents that final transfer. By preventing that final transfer, you get issues with the ATP synthase, and that's why cyanide is a poison. We're not going to talk about anything clinical here. You might need to know it, but this is a clinical review, so you can pause this slide and read it real quick if, you, if you're interested. All right, this is important. This is extremely important. You do have, in terms of the biochemistry uh, reactions, all the glycogen making and glycogen breaking diseases are high. So none of the inborn errors of metabolism are particularly high yield. Uh, they do account, you know, this stuff can be tested. I think the way the USMLE breaks it down, it's between 5 to 10% of the exam can show up as biochemistry. Um, and maybe another, or 20% shows up as biochemistry, and then about 10 to 15% of that can be an inborn error of metabolism. The problem is you don't know which one's going to show up, right? Um, they don't tell you ahead of time. That being said, the most common inborn errors of metabolism of carbohydrates are within the glycogen making and breaking pathways, you know, the glycogen storage diseases. You know, they take up the large bulk um, of those uh, diseases.
So it's good to understand what's going on. So where does glycogenesis happen? Where do we make the glycogen? In muscles, liver, adipose tissue. Um, enzymes that are involved are going to be the glycogen synthase and the glucosal transfer. So let's take a look at what happens. Glycogen synthase is going to use UDP glucose to sort of build these alpha-1-4 bonds. All right, so you get these alpha-1-4 bonds. So this is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4. So notice here, 1 to 4, 1 to 4. Now, what you can have is 1-6 bonds, and those are formed by branching enzymes. All right, so that's the 1-6 bond, all right? That's the 1-6 bond. So notice here what branching enzyme does, it adds a new 1-6 bond. So glycogen synthase, you had two existing branches, right? This was These are alpha-1-4 connections, and this branch is an alpha-1-6 connection. What glycogen synthase does, it just adds more alpha-1-4 bonds, and this adds more alpha-1-4 bonds, right? And if you're ever confused on which one it is, just remember the general shape. Just draw your little hexagon for glucose, and think if you want to add carbs in a straight line, this is carbon 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, and I'm going to draw five and six here. If you want to make a straight line, you have to go this way, you know, one through four. If you want to make a branch, you have to kind of go off to the side, one, six. All right, you're never going to forget it if you just picture the hexagon that is glucose in your mind and then draw one through four, one through six. That being said, you're not particularly likely to be tested on that. You technically still need to know it. So... These are the branching enzymes, and this is the which adds those new alpha-1-6, right? You see here you have a new alpha-1-6 bond, and glycogen synthase just extended the pre-existing chains, okay? Now, how is this regulated, right? Like I said, the regulation is so important. So insulin will stimulate glycogenesis. How? It will decrease the phosphorylation of this glycogen synthase, which increases its activity. So in a previous lecture, I said, you know, you don't want to always think that phosphorylation switches things on. It can switch them on or off depending on the context. Here, the increase, the decrease of the phosphorylation of glycogen synthase is what turns it on. And insulin, as a general rule, upregulates protein phosphatases. All right. So you can try to group this together to remember it uh, more easily because you say, OK, insulin works through protein phosphatases. So I expect whatever it's going to do, it's going to, most of the time, it's going to involve dephosphorylation. Okay, if I were to go one step further, so how do I think insulin is going to affect glycogen synthesis? Well, the glycogen synthase in states of high sugar, which is when insulin signaling occurs, when the pancreas and the beta cells of the pancreas detect elevated glucose, insulin gets released, right? And there's a whole lecture on that if you want to watch it in one of the cell in the cell signaling lecture. So that insulin gets released and it's going to signal, okay, we have sugar, now's the time to make glycogen. Because what's glycogen? It's a storage form of glucose. All right. So the way glycogenesis is regulated, the glycogen synthase will be dephosphorylated, that will increase its activity. And it will add more glucose to glycogen, lowering the level of glucose in the blood and providing a storage form that can be used later. All right. Now, what's going to do the opposite of that? Glucagon. So glucagon and will act only on the liver. Insulin will act at the muscle, liver, and adipose tissue to make, um, to make glycogen. And yes, adipose tissue does um, make glycogen. That being said, it's at very low levels, and you're not going to be tested on it, but adipose tissue does contain very low levels of glycogen. Mainly what we're talking about is going to be muscles and liver. When you're tested, when you're talking, speaking clinically, you're really talking about the muscles and the liver. We talk about glycogen storage and inability to store, and where we see those disease effects, it's virtually always going to involve the, livers and the liver and the muscle, sometimes both, sometimes one, depending on which enzyme is uh, not regulated. So insulin acts on the muscles and the liver. Uh, there's no discrimination. There, there are different um, glucose transporters. It must be on the scope right now. Glucagon, on the other hand, is going to act only on the liver while epinephrine acts on both. And in both of these situations, and let's kind of think about why, 
epinephrine would act on both, but glucagon only acts on the liver. Glucagon is about this sort of metabolic stasis situation. So it's like, oh, our sugar's going down and we need to get it back up. We need to do gluconeogenesis. And that's going to involve breaking down our glycogen stores and creating glucose from other um, molecules like amino acids or fatty fat stores. So glucagon will act on the liver only. Epinephrine is more of a stress response hormone. So not only does the liver need to start releasing the sugar because our body's gonna, our brain's going to need it and our muscles are going to need it and our heart's going to need it. Because if we need to fight, you know, epinephrine, fight or flight, if we need to fight, we need to have the energy available. So it's not just going to tell the liver to start breaking down its stores and releasing all that sugar into the bloodstream, but it's also going to tell the muscle to break down um, its stores. All right. So that's pretty important. Why? Because the muscle needs that sugar to be ready. That muscles need to be ready. So that's why epinephrine acts on both and glucagon only acts on the liver. I don't think you'll be particularly tested on that nuance, but what this does help with is remembering that both glucagon and epinephrine uh, increase phosphorylation of glycogen synthase. All right, so you're decreasing its activity. This isn't the time to make glycogen. This is the time to break glycogen. So we're going to phosphorylate glycogen synthase uh, through the protein kinase A cascade, and we're not going to let you um, make more glycogen because right now we need all the glucose we can get. And on the other hand, you have glycogenolysis. It's going to happen in the exact same spots. Again, we're focusing mainly on the muscles and the liver. So the enzymes are glycogen phosphorylase. So it's going to break down these chains. And then you have debranching enzyme, which is going to take, it's also the oligo alpha-1,4, alpha-1,4 glucan transferase. Why? Because it takes this uh, bond and it creates a new alpha 1 4 alpha 1 4 it takes one oligo which means a few sugars and attaches it to another uh, all, uh, longer uh, carbohydrate chain so you have a new alpha 1 4 bond and then you get this free um, sugar that's claved off here what we're focusing most on are glycogen phosphorylase debranching enzyme and then phosphoglucomutase because that changes G1P into G6P. And then G6P can be, um, what do you call it, Re brought down to glucose and released into the bloodstream. If you can't, if for some reason you can't turn glucose 1-phosphate into glucose 6-phosphate, or you can't turn glucose 6-phosphate into glucose, you can't, it doesn't matter how well the other enzymes of glycogenolysis are working you just won't be able to release that sugar into the bloodstream. So G6P will start to build up and you'll get this bat metabolic backup. All right. Now, looking at the substrate, it's going to be glycogen. Uh, what's going to stimulate it? Well, if we just talked about this, if glucagon and epinephrine phosphorylate glycogen synthase to decrease its activity, they will phosphorylate and activate the phosphorylase because this is going to be what frees up the glucose. The whole point of glucagon and epinephrine is to release glucose into the bloodstream. So glucagon and epinephrine are going to act on um, are going to act through the PKA pathway, and that's going to lead to phosphorylation and activation of the phosphorylase. Epinephrine will also have a set, there's another pathway um, using a different receptor that isn't particularly important for us to know. Just know that there is a calcium dependent process that upregulates the phosphorylase kinase. So the thing, so there's two ways it gets activated. It gets activated directly by epinephrine through one uh, mechanism. And then there's a second mechanism where epinephrine activates the phosphorylase by activating something that activates the phosphorylase. And that's a calcium dependent process. And in terms of inhibitors, the opposite's going to apply. So insulin is going to dephosphorylate and that decreases the function of the phosphorylase. Why? In states of insulin release, you already have enough sugar physiologically. So there's no need for phosphorylase, and how does insulin act? Through dephosphorylation. Is phosphorylase more active or less active with dephosphorylation? Less active with dephosphorylation. All right, so there's two uh, enzymes that kind of want to distinguish between hexokinase and glucokinase. Hexokinase is in all the tissues. Um, there's feedback mechanism with G6P. Um, it's more of a metabolic function, and the disease states you need to think about are hemolytic anemia. So this is the glucose transporter, or not transporter, but the um, 
the phosphorylation enzyme that sequesters and traps glucose inside the cell. When you phosphorylate glucose, that's like a tag that says, okay, you're in the cell now and you're going to be used for metabolism. Otherwise, it can go right back out the way it came. All right, so that's how we trap it. Hexokinase traps glucose for metabolic reasons, okay? Um, glucokinase is more for sensor, sensing and homeostasis, all right? It doesn't really have an allosteric uh, loop to it. It's really used just for the liver to know how much glucose there is, so it knows what storage mechanism is most appropriate, and for the pancreas to monitor levels of glucose and release insulin as um, or glucagon as required. Now, they, now, why am I bringing these up? Because there's clinical conditions related to both. Remember that red blood cells only use glycolysis for energy. So if you can't trap um, glucose within the red blood cell using hexokinase, it doesn't have an energy source. And that leads to a quick breakdown of the red blood cell or hemolytic anemia. Hemo meaning blood, lytic meaning splitting. In the case of glucokinase mutations, um, what we're talking about are MODI mutations or mature onset diabetes of the young. And here's how you can think about this. And when we say mature onset diabetes, we're talking about type 2 diabetes, right, which is usually decreased sensitivity. So you might be thinking, oh, but then if it's onset of the young, does that mean type 1 diabetes? No. Not all diabetes that happens in youth is type 1 diabetes. The mechanism is different. In type 1 diabetes, you have an autoimmune reaction. All right, there's an autoimmune reaction that has destroyed the beta cells. You do not make insulin. You need supplemental insulin. In mature onset diabetes of the young, you are you don't have sensitivity. Why? Because you have a mutation in glucokinase. The enzyme responsible for tracking your blood sugar levels does not work. So that's why. Yeah, so what I want to point out here are a couple steps. The first one is hexokinase, like we talked about. You can see here, glucose comes in, hexokinase phosphorylates it, and that dedicates it to metabolism. That phosphorylation sequesters the glucose and dedicates it to metabolism. And then another reaction happens, and then this is the other major rate limiting. This is this is not the other. This is the rate limiting step of glycolysis, phosphofructokinase 1, PFK1. And what that does, it takes the fructose 6-phosphate and makes it fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and then all of the stuff that happens with glycolysis um, continues here. All right, there's another pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway, but we'll talk more about that later. Since red blood cells use glucose for energy, any defect in glycolysis will cause a hemolytic anemia. All right? There's a different kind of hemolytic anemia that occurs with this deficiency in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, but we'll talk about it later. Um, for now, think generally speaking, this pathway creates your antioxidants. And in the absence of these antioxidants, the red blood cell is more vulnerable to oxidative stress. You have a mutation in this. Um, you have oxidative hemolytic anemia in the presence of an offending agent. But we'll talk more about it. And the other thing I want to point out here is pyruvate kinase. So phosphoenolpyruvate is that last dedicated step, it pushes it towards pyruvate, and then pyruvate can either become lactate in the anaerobic metabolism or acetyl-CoA and then enter aerobic metabolism. But note here that PDH is what pushes pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. So let's say you have a defect in pyruvate dehydrogenase, any of the enzymes in that complex, this builds up. Pyruvate will build up because you can't enter through here. And you can supply other nutrients that can enter the, the tricyclic acid cycle, but this step does not occur. And if this step does not occur, this builds up. If this builds up, it goes into the lactic acid pathway as well. And that causes a lot of damage, as we'll see in a bit. The mo so you can go through this at your own leisure, but what I would really want to emphasize is what activates is going to be insulin, because when your body has excess sugar, it wants you to use it. What deactivates is glucagon, because when the body wants to make new glucose and prioritize it for the brain, it doesn't want you using that glucose in other cells. So glucagon and its target cells prevents uh, glycolysis, all right? Um, and the other main thing to point out is with pyruvate kinase, that buildup of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, because remember, phosphofructokinase makes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, all right? So buildup of 1,6-bisphosphate and pyruvate kinase is a, is a downstream step. It says, look, we have all this built up. We need to finish the reaction, all right? And what I really want to linger on for regulation is the regulation of PFK. So as you know, fructose 6-phosphate 
gets turned into fructose 1,6 bisphosphate. All right, and that's what after that all the magic happens, and that's done by PFK. I'm going to call it PFK1. All right, there's another enzyme called it's a two part enzyme called PFK2 FBPase, fructose bisphosphatase. All right, and what this PFK2 um, FBPase does is that it takes the fructose 6-phosphate, and when the PFK2 function is predominant, it's going to make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. All right? It's going to make fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. When the FBPase function is more active, it's going to break down the fructose 6-phosphate and prevent this from accumulating. This PFK2 has a higher affinity. It binds this fructose 6-phosphate, has a higher affinity than PFK1. PFK1 does not bind the fructose 6-phosphate as strongly. What that and why that's important is because fructose 6-phosphate, as I've highlighted here, feeds back onto PFK1 and then activates it. All right. So what that means is that there's an internal sensor, even in the absence of insulin and glucagon signaling, there's an internal sensor that says, okay, how much sugar do we have? And it measures that through the amount of fructose 6-phosphate. As fructose 6-phosphate builds up, it gets pushed into the 2,6-bisphosphate pathway. As it builds up in the 2,6-bisphosphate pathway, it reaches a threshold where it then positively pushes glycolysis through uh, allosteric regulation of PFK1. So PFK1 gets switched on by the fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and that allows dedicated glycolysis and the formation of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to occur. Um, in the presence of FBPase function, that doesn't happen. All right, so what, what causes increases and decreases in either of these functions? We've established that there's a baseline level, and that baseline level will feed back onto PFK1 and influence it. But how, do, how is that altered by hormone signaling, which is ultimately the most important part of this? In the presence of glucagon, remember glucagon acts through protein kinase A and phosphorylation, glucagon's phosphorylation of this enzyme increases the FBPase function. Remember, it's one enzyme with two parts. And when it increases this FBPase function, that is going to prevent the accumulation of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. That means that PFK1 will not be stimulated. And if PFK1 is not stimulated, um, you will not have the breakdown of glucose, which is important for glucagon's function, because glucagon wants you to spare sugar wherever possible. When we look at insulin, insulin, we've established that it acts through protein phosphatases. So the dephosphorylation of this enzyme, remember it's a two-part, it's an enzyme with two parts, the FBPase and the PFK2. But dephosphorylation of this two-part enzyme activates the phosphofructokinase function. What does insulin want you to do? There's extra sugar, it wants you to break it down. So it activates PFK2, so more uh, FP, F6P becomes F26BP. That fructose 2,6-bisphosphate will then activate phosphofructokinase in the glycolysis pathway, and that will take all that extra sugar and push it through uh, glycolysis. All right? There's a couple of things pyruvate can become. What I want to draw... Um, a lot of emphasis on is the acetyl coa all right um because if it this enzyme is inhibited and you can go through the rest of this at your own leisure but if this is inhibited you get build up in the other pathways all right and most notably the lactate pathway all right so in the in this uh set of reactions the gluconeogenesis reactions there's a couple things i want to uh, point out uh, pyruvate, first of all, the very first reaction requires a vitamin called biotin, and I'm not going to go into it now, but this vitamin deficiency is a big deal. Uh, I might go, I might make a vitamin lecture, I might not, so I would review that in your own time. But this pyruvate carboxylase reaction requires a vitamin cofactor called biotin. But in terms of regulation, what I want to focus on is this step, and it's sort of the opposite of glycolysis. And glycolysis, fructose 6-phosphate through phosphofructokinase 1 becomes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. In gluconeogenesis, this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is broken down back to fructose 6-phosphate. And they're both, you know, they're mirror images of each other. This is the major rate-limiting step of glycolysis. This is the major rate-limiting step of gluconeogenesis. So what's going to activate gluconeogenesis and this rate-limiting step? Glucagon, because that's its whole deal. What's going to inhibit gluconeogenesis and inhibit this step? Insulin, because that's what insulin does. All right, and then the energy levels. All right.
I don't want to draw out the whole pentose phosphate pathway. What I want to emphasize is that the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme converts glucose 6-phosphate to 6-phosphogluconate, and that gives uh, rise to the ribulose, you know, the five carbon sugars. Let's, let me put it this way. Glucose 6-phosphate is turned into a different, uh, you know, sugar by G6P dehydrogenase, and then that's used to make the reduced, the five carbon sugars. To reduce the sugars, you also, sorry, to oxidize these sugars, you need to generate NADPH, all right? So NADPH, through its interactions with glutathione, will be an antioxidant. And defects in G6PD give rise to hemolytic anemia in the context of oxidative membrane damage because you don't have enough ADPH to act as reducing equivalents. You can't reduce um, the oxidative species. Um, one thing I want, two, two things I want to point out with... Um, this reaction. First, the aldolase and the fructokinase. So the fructokinase, it's similar to the hexokinase for glucose, where it traps fructose for, um, what do you call it, for metabolic functioning. Okay. What I want you to note here is that it immediately becomes uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or DHAP. So it has, so phosphofructokinase has no uh, nothing to do whatsoever with this reaction. This fructokinase is not phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase takes glucose 6-phosphate uh, and makes it uh, not, sorry, it takes fructose 6-phosphate and makes it fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Fructokinase just traps fructose in the form of fructose 1-phosphate. And then a separate enzyme called aldolase, and there is a deficiency um, that you need to know clinically with this aldolase. This aldolase will generate these intermediates, and then these intermediates will, you know, continue on the glycolysis pathway. So there's a way to convert glucose to fructose. Um, it's called the polyol pathway, and whenever there's too much glucose, it sort of shunts it out of the way. So at the end, so glucose gets reduced to sorbitol and then oxidized into fructose. And that's how the body deals with excess glucose when it can't be used for anything else. Now there's a problem. This, the kidneys, the nervous system, and the retina can't do the second reaction. Okay? What disease state has very high sugar? Diabetes mellitus. So in diabetes mellitus, you're going to get a lot of sugar, even type 1 diabetes, but I'm thinking more of the kidney damage and sort of you think of with type 2 diabetes, you think of damage to blood vessels because of the high sugar levels, but you also think of damage to the nervous system, damage to the kidneys, and damage to the retina. And some of that is because of damage to the vessels, but, this, but there's a more direct acute effect of much elevated glucose, which is that the sorbitol, remember, these cells cannot change the sorbitol into fructose. So sorbitol builds up in the kidneys, in the nervous system, and the retina. And I really want to emphasize the retina here. And you get osmotic damage of the retina in severe hyperglycemia. In severe acute hyperglycemia, these cells get damaged because they don't have a way to turn sorbitol into fructose. All right? You want, while you might not be directly tested on this, this helps you remember what the pathology and pathophysiology of severe hyperglycemia is down the line when you learn about diabetes. Now, galactose metabolism, all I really want to emphasize is that if you can't go this way, you have to go that way. So the same way where sorbitol building up causes osmotic damage, galactitol building up causes osmotic damage. All right. So if for some reason you have a deficiency in galactose uh, ureal transferase or galactokinase, you get builds up buildups of galactitol. All right. And the Cori cycle, basically all it is is that when the muscle uses glucose, it makes lactate because muscles function anaerobically, like when you're lifting. Um, and the lactate will dissolve into the plasma and go to the liver, and the liver converts it back to glucose. So we finally got through the first half. Um, go drink some water, go for a walk, freshen your mind, because now we have the second half of the lecture, which is going to be cases. All right, so this is the fun stuff, the cases. So case one, that's a rotund baby. A six-month-old girl presents in your pediatric clinic due to fatigue. 
in between meals, she is restless, physical exams pertinent for very fat cheeks and abdomen with disparately thin extremities. Her labs are significant for severe hypoglycemia, elevated serum uric acid, and elevated serum lipids. All right, so let's break it down. What do you think? So the first part of answering any clinical vignette is the presentation. This is the way that questions are framed on the USMLE. They all have this structure. The first thing you get is a quick description of the patient, then their subjective exam, then their physical exam, and then the labs and imaging at the end. So the first part, that very first sentence is already giving you information. So who is the patient? All right, so the patient is presenting with this, you know, uh, distended abdomen or very fatty abdomen, very fat cheeks, um, and very thin wasted extremities. Now that differential diagnosis is very different in a six month old girl versus a 60 year old woman or in a 25 year old man, right? It's very different, different differential. So remember that infancy and early childhood is when a lot of genetic diseases present. So if you have a six month old girl presenting with severe symptoms, you need to think about a genetic illness. Now, What's the importance of decreased glucose in a patient with restlessness or irritability? Well, the patient is restless and irritable, I'm not feeding well, and they have decreased glucose, that kind of tells you that the sugar is affecting their mental status to an extent, whether they're just ha extra hangry or whether there's some you know, altered mental, because it's very hard to detect altered mental status in a baby. You can't ask, check if a baby's alerted. So the way we check mental status, the first step is, are you alerted to yourself, the place, and like time, person, place, and time? You can't really ask a baby who's the president, what year is it, what's your name? So these cues, so this restlessness or irritability in the context of a reduced glucose and this patient that does not look well, um, that points uh, towards, towards, again, more of a pointer towards a genetic illness that is causing hypoglycemia, and this hypoglycemia is altering the baby. Now, as a gimme, I'm going to tell you that the hyperuricemia is due to a combination of decreased renal clearance and increased hepatic production. Beyond the scope right now, don't fixate on it. Just know that they are part of the classic presentation, that, the, that there's hyperuricemia and hyperlipidemia. All right? So this condition is von Yerich disease. It's a type 1 glycogen storage disease. I told you guys that glycogen storage diseases were going to be important, and we're starting with type 1 and that's von Gehrig disease. The defect is in the glucose 6-phosphatase. Remember what I said, that glu G glucose 6-phosphate has to be broken down to glucose so it can leave the cell. The glucose 6-phosphate is the form that traps glucose and dedicates it to metabolism. And von Gehrig disease, the glucose 6-phosphate doesn't get actually um, broken down. Why? Because it's an autosomal recessive mutation in the glucose 6-phosphatase. And the buildup of glucose 6-phosphate leads to buildup of glycogen in the liver and the kidney, and that's why it looks like the abdomen is enlarged or fat. It's a protuberant, a protuberant abdomen secondary to the hepatomegaly. Um, and the consequence of impeded gluconeogenesis, because you can't free that glucose, is fasting hypoglycemia. All right, so patients will typically prevent an infancy with hepatomegaly or hypoglycemia. Patients have doll-like faces, very chubby cheeks like a doll, thin extremities. They don't grow well because you need sugar to grow. They have a protuberant abdomen because they have hepatomegaly. The lab findings are hypoglycemia, lactic acidosis, hyperuricemia, and hyperlipidemia. Why a lactic acidosis? Um, Part of the reason why is because if you can't depend on um, aerobic metabolism and you're having trouble freeing glucose, you're going to go into the lactate uh, pathways. Um, now for the treatment, the oral cornstarch supplementation, you're going to note that for a lot of the glycogen storage diseases. Um, you're going to restrict galactose and fructose. Um, you really want to make sure that oral cornstarch is the main source of sugar, all right? And you're going to use allopurinol, and that's a medication that keeps uh, the urate levels low so you don't get gout later. But um, you're going to note the core oral cornstarch is going to come up again and again. So the hepatic uh, 
uh, glycogen storage diseases that present with hepatomegaly and hypoglycemia include von Gerich disease, which is type 1, Hare's disease, which is liver phosphorylase deficiency, or type 6, or mutations in the protein kinase that activates that phosphorylase. All right, so it's either coming from the von Gerich, it's coming from glucose 6-phosphate, or it's coming because you can't actually break down the glycogen, and that's Hare's disease, or the enzyme that breaks down the glycogen isn't regulated properly, and that's the type 9. All right. In type 1, the issue is the inability to free the glucose, leading to an accumulation of glycogen in the liver and hypoglycemia. In type 6 and 9, the issue is deficiencies in the functioning of the protein that trims the glycogen chains in the liver. And that's how you get an accumulation of glycogen and hypoglycemia. Nothing to fear, adolescence will be here. A four-year-old boy is brought in for a routine physical. He is not meeting his physical growth development milestones. On physical exam, you note hepatomegaly and decreased muscle strength. Labs are pertinent for mild hypoglycemia with slight elevation of liver enzymes. So how is this presentation different from the one we just saw? You don't really see an altered mental status. Really, you're noticing a mild hypoglycemia. But how is it similar? You have some muscle weakness, some growth stuff. It's, it's, there are similarities, it's just not as severe. And that's the liver phosphorylase deficiency, which is type 6. So here the defect is an autosomal recessive mutation in glycogen phosphorylase, which is required to break the alpha-1-4 bonds in the glycogen and release of glucose 1-phosphate. The absence of the glycogen phosphorylase leads to accumulation in the liver and fasting hypoglycemia. It presents early in childhood with hepatomegaly, mild hypoglycemia, and growth retardation. Patients may have muscle weakness or other rare variant mutations. You're going to have mildly elevated liver enzymes, hyperlipidemia, and hypoglycemia. Again, the treatment here is oral cornstarch supplementation. That's how you provide the sugars. You're going to restrict galactose and fructose. You're going to use allopurinol to manage your rate levels, and this usually resolves by adolescence. Actually, you don't need to restrict galactose and fructose, and you don't need allopurinol here. So that was a copy and paste error that I'm just noticing now on my part. My bad. So the main treatment is oral cornstarch supplementation, and the hepatomegaly will resolve by adolescence. All right, but you will use oral corn star supplementation uh, for a while. Then you get to myocardial disease, uh, and that's type five. All right. So this is the reason why I'm grouping it here is this is a mutation in the muscle glycogen phosphorylase. So in the muscle glycogen glycogen phosphorylase, this is a bigger deal because if you can't metabolize the glycogen in the muscle, that leads to myopathy. All right, so that buildup of glycogen damages the muscle. It'll present in adulthood. Compare that to liver phosphorylase deficiency that presents in childhood. Mechardal disease, muscle, MM, mechardal, mechadult, mechadultal, mechardal, will present in, it's a muscle glycogen phosphorylase deficiency that presents in adulthood. It takes the form of exercise intolerance and muscle cramping with exertion. Rhabdomyolysis or breakdown of the muscle will lead to dark colored urine and that's from the myoglobin in the muscle. Um, and that can cause a kidney injury. So a patient can present with a kidney injury as well. The lab findings will be elevated creatinine kinase at rest. So the treatment is to avoid strenuous exercise, increase tolerance of exercise with a monitored graduated training program. Um, and you always take in a bunch of sucrose and glucose beforehand to provide energy. So basically what happens is that glycogen, it builds up, it can't be broken down, you can't use it, and that's what muscles primarily use as their energy source. They break down the glycogen into glucose, and then they use the glucose. If you can't metabolize glycogen in the muscle, you actually, the muscle dies. You get rhabdomyolysis, and that's very dangerous because the myoglobin from the muscle can actually damage the kidney. So that's why I said patients can present with a simultaneous kidney injury, because when rhabdomyolysis is bad enough, you can damage the kidney. So case three, owed to a lysosome. A two-month-old girl presents for failure to thrive. She has decreased muscle tone, a large tongue, and mild hepatomegaly. Analysis of her heart function is concerning for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Lab studies reveal elevated creatinine kinase and aspartate transaminase. Biopsy of the muscle specimen that stain reveals vacuoles that stain for glycogen. So let's underline a few things. It's a two-month-old girl. Failure to thrive. Immediately genetic condition. Genetic condition. 
she has decreased, and that's that's not the only thing on the differential, but you better be thinking about it. She has decreased muscle tone, a large tongue, and mild hepatomegaly. You have multi-organ system involvement. All right. Analysis of her heart function is concerning for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. All right. You have a large tongue, a large heart, decreased muscle tone, and an enlarged liver. And you're going to see increased heart enzyme. These are muscle enzymes specifically. Um, increased, but you can they, it can come from the muscle, can be coming either from the heart or from your muscles' muscles. But you have an elevated creatinine kinase and elevated liver enzymes. When you biopsy the muscle specimen, you see vacuoles that stain for glycogen. So what is being, what are we told now? We have vacuoles that stain for glycogen, so we have a glycogen storage disease. We have a buildup of glycogen in vacuoles, all right? Those should be broken down, but they're not. So it's a type of glycogen storage disease. We have liver and muscle damage and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In addition, we have a large tongue, which is a relatively unique, um, you know, defining feature. So that's how this is different from the other cases. You have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, glossitis, or an enlarged tongue, or macroglossia, more not glossitis, macroglossia, and you have vacuoles that stain for glycogen. Does this seem mild or serious to you guys? I would say this is serious. I would say this is serious. So it's very so it's already presenting a lot differently. You have damn you have this hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the heart. You have this buildup of stuff in the, um, in the vacuoles and cells. What is the pertinence of the elevated AST and CK? We talked about that. It's going to be the fact that the liver and the muscles are concomitantly involved, and the heart is not the only organ involved. It's not even the only muscle involved. Her other muscles aren't working well. So all this is coming together. How well do you think this patient is going to do? How long do you think this patient has? And most importantly, again, those vacuoles containing large amounts of glycogen, um, that's not a good picture because that tells us that we have a, not only do we have a glycogen storage disease, something is accumulating where it should not be accumulating. And that gives us Pompeii disease, which is one of the other, in my mind, the other major glycogen storage disease. And it's very different from the other ones because oral cornstarch supplementation is not going to do anything here. Um, because the defect is the fact that the lysosome, it's an autosomal recessive mutation, the lysosome itself, the alpha-1,4 glucosidase or acid maltase will not function. And that means that in the vacuoles of skeletal muscle, in the liver, in the cardiomyocytes, in the kidneys, these vacuoles will accumulate glycogen and that has a toxic effect. All right. So you get a multi-system uh, disease. In infants, you're going to die within a year. All right. There's no treatment. In the juvenile form, this presents more in ch later childhood, more progressive. It's not as lethal as quickly, but patients still probably won't make it into middle age. They won't make it. It's rare for them to make it to their 40s. In the adult form, it's a slow. It starts in adulthood. It's a slow and progressive muscle weakness. The infantile form isn't treatable. You're going to use a protein-oriented diet. You're going to avoid providing sugar as much as possible to prevent accumulation of glycogen. Um, really, it's supportive and palliative care. There is no treatment. If your lysosomes don't work with the technology we have now, there's no way to fix that. Case four, the branch doesn't fall far. An eight-year-old Jewish boy presents with muscle weakness that began six months ago. At that time, he noticed that he was tiring easily and couldn't keep up with his friend for more than a few minutes. His mother is concerned because one of her brothers from Ethiopia has a genetic condition requiring him to be on a special diet, and one of her uncles died at a young age. Physical exam is notable for short stature and muscle wasting. He has hypoglycemia and elevated liver enzymes. So how is this different from Pompeii and von Gehrig? Well, this is presenting primarily in the muscles. And how is it similar? You have this tiredness, this weakness. It's it's a similar theme, but it's less multi-system. You know, there's, it seems to be one organ that's involved, the muscles. What is the pertinence of elevated AST and CK? Okay, so you have elevated liver enzymes and you have elevated mu muscle enzymes, 
but that on its own doesn't tell you anything because remember the Pompeii disease had the same exact labs with the elevated AST and CK, but the patient's presentation told you 90% of the story. You would have already been suspecting Pompeii disease in that little in that girl, regardless of how she of what her lab said. Right. So the labs just sort of confirmed what we're looking for, because as you can see here, the labs are very similar. You have elevated AST and CK, but the patient isn't presenting nearly as you know, in terms of how sick is this patient. This isn't a, this might not be a patient you're sending to the ICU. Right. That patient, depending on how bad she is, you may. And she's going to be dead within a year. This is very different. Um, would you expect inheritance pattern be autosomal dominant or recessive? Um, here I, I wanted to kind of test you on your recognition of inheritance patterns. I'm not going to draw an actual pedigree, but mom is okay, son is affected, all right? Brother is affected. Um, so actually, I want to draw more emphasis just to this. Mother is not affected, son is affected, all right? If mom is affected and son is affected, um, there's two things it could be. It could be X-linked or it could be autosomal. But I'm already telling you that it's that it's autosomal. All right, so don't worry about X-linked inheritance right now. If this was a dominant trait and he got it from his mother, because there's family history on the mother's side, if it's an autosomal dominant trait, the mom would have it too, because she would have to be carrying the allele. And we're going to assume that the dad is healthy, right? Dad is com double check mark, completely healthy. We don't know what mom's status is, but if we know for sure that dad is completely healthy and the son has the condition and it's an auto and and the mom doesn't. That means she has to be the one carrying the allele. And if she's carrying the allele and she's not sick, that means it's a recessive disease. All right, that brings us to Cori disease, which is the type three of the glycogen storage uh, diseases. And it's an autosomal recessive mutation in the debranching enzyme. All right, and you can kind of figure out that that's gonna lead to glycogen accumulating because you can't debranch it. Um, that leads to liver and muscle disease, the places where glycogen is stored. So very different from Pompe disease, where you had a problem with the vacuoles and you had a very multi-system uh, process going on. Here it's more, there's not proper debranching and it's primarily affecting the liver and the muscle. And you're going to get hypoglycemia, hyperlipidemia, growth retardation, myopathies, and that can include the heart sometimes, hepatosplenomegaly, with the hepatomegaly resolving after puberty. Um, the treatment, you're going to use cornstarch to prevent hypoglycemia, and you're going to do a high-protein diet to help with the myopathy. Um, but it's mainly symptom. You're mainly treating symptoms and working around that. The prognosis is not nearly as bad as with Pompe disease. And then you have Anderson disease. This is so we talk about debranching enzyme. This is a mutation in branching enzyme. Um, and it's an, the inability to branch leads to these very long chains of glycogen in the liver, the nervous system, and the heart. Um, and it presents infantile, so very different from Cori disease. Cori disease, present, it's debranching enzyme, presents more in adulthood. The, you can't really break the glycogen down, and that's why it's accumulating. Here, you can't branch the glycogen, and because it can't branch, it's going to present very early in infancy, and you're going to have this liver disease and failure to thrive, and it's really bad. Um, because it's involving the nervous system and the heart, so you get these long branches, long chains of glycogen that are toxic, and really all you can do is supportive care or a liver transplantation. Um, the prognosis is very poor otherwise. Case 5, ataxia, athetosis, hypotonia, oh my. A five-year-old boy is brought to the pediatrician due to poor coordination and difficulty walking. Physical exam is notable for poor visual tracking with poor bilateral pupil response. He has random flailing arm movements, and that's athetosis. Labs pertinent for lactic acidosis. Oh, I should have said ataxia, athetosis, acidosis, oh my. That's fine, though. All right. So what do you think? This is pretty different. Do you think it's a glycogen storage disease? It seems to be more of a nervous system issue. So why is it important that the nervous system is the first system involved, right? It tells you a couple things. Um, there are certain lipid metabolism diseases that affect the nervous system first because it targets the, you know, sheath, the myelin sheaths. But in this case, because um, because we're talking about carbohydrate metabolism, what you want to keep in mind is that the nervous system requires so much glucose that any inborn error of metabolism involving glucose, the first place it's going to manifest is the muscles. Uh, sorry, not the muscles, the nervous system, and then the muscles. All right. So what does increased lactate tell us? 
All right, so we're already saying, okay, there's a problem somewhere in the glucose pathway because it's purely neuro presenting early. Um, so now we see there's an increased lactate. What does it tell us? What becomes lactate? Pyruvate. Okay, well, if we have pyruvate, the problem isn't before pyruvate. The problem is at pyruvate. So what would cause not enough energy and a buildup of lactate from the pyruvate step? Well, if pyruvate is being shunted into lactate. Why is it being shunted into lactate? Because it can't get into this into acetyl COA and enter this tricyclic acid cycle. And that's why there's an energy deficit. And that's why the illness here is, if anyone wants to take a guess before I flip the slide, now is the time. Pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. It's an X-linked recessive mutation, usually in one of the components of the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And that leads to an accumulation of pyruvate and deficiencies in acetyl COA. The energy deficit leads to a nervous system dysfunction. The backup of pyruvate and shunt into the lactic acid pathway lead to lactic acidosis. It's the <clears throat> condition manifests as progressive neurologic symptoms beginning in an infant usually that can present into late childhood, you know, associated with developmental delays, poor muscle tone, ataxia, athetosis, defects in eye movement, seizures. Um, you'll have increased pyruvate and lactate and an anion gap metabolic acidosis secondary to the lactic acid. So don't worry too much about if you haven't taken uh, electrolytes and acid base disorders yet. Don't worry about this last sentence. Um, but if you have, then you should know what this is. And you should know that lactate is an organic acid, and that organic acid is not accounted for in the anion gap equation, which is sodium minus chloride minus bicarb. All right? So when this gap is increased, it means there's extra. These are the anions. This is the cation. The anion gap is the gap between these and sodium. When this gap is increased, that means that whatever you subtracted here didn't account for the anions, right? Because this gap is increased. So it's like, oh, well, there's a, there's still a gap. What's causing the gap? It's usually an, ex, an extra acid. In this case, lactic acid is that extra acid, and you get an anion gap metabolic acidosis. You're ketogenic. You're going to have to put them on a ketogenic diet with lysine and leucine supplementation, and here's why. So note where lysine and leucine enter. A lot of the amino acids have overlap at where they're entering. But if you look here, if you can't make acetyl-CoA, which ones are only going to become acetyl-CoA? The pure ketogenic amino acids. It's going to be lysine and leucine because these are both glucogenic. Either, either they're glucogenic if you're trying to, you're not going to give these because you're not trying to provide um, pyruvate. And these can become pyruvate. Tryptophan and threonine or can become pyruvate as well. And they can enter downstream of this cycle. So the ones that you're going to give, they're going to act that can be these amino acids that can become acetyl COA, the body can convert them. That's going to be lysine and leucine. So you're going to use lysine and leucine supplementation because what you do is that they will become acetyl COA and only acetyl COA and they will go through the full citric acid cycle. That way you you bypass the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So don't let anyone tell you that you can't use the Krebs cycle to treat a patient. You probably will never do it in your life, but don't tell them that you that you can't. You can, all right? I take offense to people who say that. That brings us also to glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. I already talked about this a lot, so I didn't want to do a full vignette. Um, I just want to talk about the pathophysiology a bit more. Um, so it's an X-linked recessive mutation in G6PD. We already talked about, you know, the effect of oxidative stress. Um, so NADPH keeps glutathione reduced because NADPH is a reducing agent. And that keeps glutathione reduced. And when glutathione is reduced, it can find the free radicals and scavenge them. In the presence of oxidative stress and the absence of NADPH, you get hemolytic anemia due to oxidative membrane damage. And you get hemolysis and anemia you know, destruction of the red blood cells. And that leads, when you break down a red blood cell, you get elevations in bilirubin. And that presents as jaundice um, and gallstones. You can get fatigue because of the hemolytic anemia itself. The labs, you'll see a normal, so it's different from iron deficiency anemia, which is hypochromic and microcytic. You get a normocytic, normochromic anemia, and you get an unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia. So this means normally, there's two forms of bilirubin, direct and indirect, or direct is conjugated, indirect is unconjugated. And indirect bilirubin means that the liver 
that's usually points towards something happening outside of the liver because if the liver is functioning normally, it takes bilirubin, conjugates it, and secretes it. So when you have liver disease, what happens is the direct conjugated bilirubin backflows into the bloodstream, whereas in an unconjugated um, hyperbilirubinemia, that usually tells you that blood cells are breaking down elsewhere in the body, and it's happening so much the liver can't keep up and taking that bilirubin, conjugating it, and then excreting it, all right? And when you have too much bilirubin, you can get pigment gallstones, all right? So the jaundice and the gallstones are coming from the bilirubin, and it's an indirect bilirubin because it's coming from the blood cells, and there's an excess bilirubin because of that. It's not coming from the liver itself, all right? So it's a different kind of jaundice. The jaundice is from bilirubin, but whether it's conjugated or unconjugated is the issue. Sorry, and the peripheral blood smear, you're going to see serocytes in Heinz bodies. The treatment, you discontinue the offending agent. Whatever is causing the oxidative stress, you just stop it. So, case six, sweet peas. An 18-year-old man presents for a routine physical exam and blood work prior to enlisting in the army. He has a completely unremarkable physical exam and no significant past medical history. Urine dipstick is pertinent for reducing sugars. Family history is pertinent for type 1 diabetes in his aunt. So what do you think is going on, right? You're thinking, oh, okay, it sounds like diabetes, right? If there's sugar in his urine and there's family history of diabetes, but now I'm going to tell you his blood glucose is 85. Does your differential change? If the blood sugar is not above 160 or uh, 180, you're not, is it 160 or 180? It's one of those numbers, 160 or 180. Um, but there's a maximum threshold at which the kidneys can't reabsorb sugar anymore. And when your blood sugar is above that, you'll start getting sugar in the urine. This 85 is still well below that threshold, all right? It's nearly half that threshold. So it's not diabetes. That lets you remove diabetes as the reason for his elevate, for the um, sugars being detected in his urine, all right? So you have to think of other sugars. What's the other major sugar you should be thinking of? If it's not glucose, it's probably fructose, and that's the essential fructose urea. So it's an autosomal recessive fructokinase deficiency. Now remember, fructokinase is like hexokinase. It traps fructose in the fructose phosphate form, so it can be used for metabolism. If you don't have fructokinase, you don't have metabolism of fructose. If you don't have metabolism of fructose, it stays in the body and you pee it out. All right, it's an asymptomatic incidental finding. You don't treat it. K7, not sweet peas. A seven-year-old boy is brought to the emergency room due to severe muscle pain during gymnastics. This has been ongoing for about seven months. He shares that he has had cola-colored urine, dark red, after practice the last month, but he was scared to say anything. Labs are pertinent for positive hemolytic anemia and muscle breakdown studies. All right. So that's Tori disease. It, the defect is an autosomal recessive mutation in the muscle phosphofructokinase. The absence of that muscle phosphofructokinase impairs glycolysis. Remember, what does PFK do? It takes fructose 6-phosphate, makes it into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, and then you go down the whole glycolysis pathway. That's the rate-limiting step, the phosphofructokinase. Here, there's a specific isoform of it mutated in the muscles, and how it manifests is as exercise intolerance and cramps with subsequent weakness and dark red urine. Uh, the labs will be pertinent for rhabdo, hyperuricemia, and hemolytic anemia. All right? The main thing I want you to, to think of is exercise intolerance with dark red urine and a muscle breakdown. All right? And it's because of a phosphofructokinase mutation specific to the muscles. And fructose intolerance um, is a mutation uh, that prevents proper metabolism of fructose. It's a problem with uh, the aldolase and fructose 1-phosphate builds up. Because remember, fructose 1-phosphate goes through the aldolase pathway, then you get those glycolytic intermediates, which are G3P and GAP, etc. And But that doesn't happen. So it gets trapped as fructose 1-phosphate, and that sequesters the phosphate and causes liver damage. All right? And, you know, the pattern, you're going to have a, a liver pattern of disease, jaundice, hepatomegaly, vomiting, a hepatic pattern um, on your, you're going to have deep, liver makes the clotting factor, so there'll be a prolonged clotting time. You're going to have hypoalbuminemia, you're going to have hyperbilirubinemia, um, 
etc. Um, other labs will include hypoglycemia and fructosemia, which are kind of intuitive. Um, there, I know this says non necessary, but that's another copy paste error. I apologize for that. Um, so here you're going to avoid fructose. All right, you're just going to avoid those sugars. You're going to avoid uh, sorbitol, um, fructose, etc. All right, case eight, jaundice, vomitus, transferus. A one-month-old girl adopted from a foreign country presents with vomiting after feeding and failure to thrive. CT of the abdomen does not show obstruction, malrotation, or volvulus. And the reason I'm including this is because typically this vomiting after feeding, failure to thrive, it's very... Uh, it usually happens with intestinal obstruction and some of the major emergencies that you need to be aware of in the pediatric population, especially in an infant, is malrotation and volvulus. Um, physical exam is pertinent for clouded lens of the eye. And this is sort of, so when a man bites dog, um, so when a dog bites man, it doesn't really surprise you. So vomiting after feeding, failure to thrive, I mean, they're important symptoms, but they're not like, oh my God, like this is something I need to lock in on. Dog, when a man bites a dog, that's a weird thing. So this is the man bites dog symptom right here. This is really stands out. Physical exam is pertinent for clouded lens of the eye. So even if you didn't have the imaging, you would know that this is an intestinal obstruction because an intestinal obstruction should not cloud the lens of the eye. This is a physical exam finding that is pertinent and notable. All right, you're seeing cataracts in the eye. So what do you think? It's okay if you don't know the answer, I don't expect you to. Um, but what I really want to point out is what's the importance of the baby being born foreign in the question stem? It's because most, not most, children born at a major hospital in the United States, they get run through a panel of inborn error of metabolism tests. But if the baby is born outside of the United States, especially if it's like a foreign adopted baby um, from a country that may not have these protocols, stuff can get missed. And this is one of the things that can be missed. And it's called classic galactosemia. The defect is an autosomal recessive mutation in galactus 1 phosphate uretal transferase. Um, what I want you to know is that that causes a buildup of galactose 1 phosphate, that causes a buildup of galactose, and that causes a buildup of galactitol. That's what I want you to know. So the, it's an auto, in classic galactosemia, you have a buildup of galactitol, and the buildup of galactitol causes toxic damage to the lens, brain, kidney. Mainly, I'm I want to emphasize the lens and the brain, kidney, liver, and spleen. And that presents as lethargy, irritability, so altered mental status, poor feeding. These are all signs of altered mental status in an infant. Liver signs, splenomegaly, uh, convulsions, poor feeding and failure to thrive, cataracts, mental retardation, um, and that's just direct damage. Cataracts... Um, is the one you're gonna see is what we saw in the physical exam, the clouded lens of the eye. And the way that you treat it is you eliminate galactose from the diet. And neonates in the US are routinely screened. That's why that foreign born part is important in the question stem. All right, now the galactokinase deficiency. So this is much more benign. So the problem is the galactokinase itself. So galactose buildup in the context of galactokinase shunts galactose into the allos reductase pathway, and that causes galactitol buildup. And that draws water into the eye and causes cataract development. Um, that's really it. You just have cataracts and developmental milestone issues because of the cataract. So it's not that the baby can't recognize objects, the baby can't see the object because they have cataracts. Um, and you treat that by restricting galactose. And then the last thing is lactose intolerance. That's just a reduced expression of lactase. Lactose enters the colon and causes an osmotic diarrhea. Um, you get diarrhea, abdominal pain, flatulence anytime you eat something with lactose and you just avoid lactose or you take lactate with it. Um, there's someone in my med school class who insists who's lactose intolerant and insists on not taking lactate, um, much to the dismay of his roommates. But um, <laughs> the treatment is... That's going to be the treatment. And in terms of the demographics, it's most common among, uh, I think it goes Asian Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans in the US. Um, they're not as prevalent among Caucasians. It's only 10 or 20 percent. And it's actually a very interesting historical reason why. So the Indo Europeans, um, they sort of lived, I'm just going to draw a crescent showing where they lived. 
and there were these grassy plains that they couldn't really explore, okay, because food was hard to find on those plains because they are so wide and vast, and you needed food to live, so they didn't go into those plains. But at some point, they developed a lactose uh, tolerance because by default, human beings are meant to be lactose intolerant. That happens by default. It's a normal switch in our physiology. But among Caucasians, specifically because of the ancestors that were the Indo-Europeans, they developed the lactose tolerance mutation and all of a sudden they could drink cow milk and now the cows could they could take the cows with them onto the plains and now they have food. Why? Cows eat grass, cows make food. What's the food? The milk and cheese and yogurt, all that stuff. So you can now drink milk. You have food. Food can move. People move with food. Food move with people. You can now explore and they end up eating Europe for breakfast. Right, all the native tribes get displaced because once they get on the plains, they find the horses. Once they find the horses, they make the chariot. And once you make the chariot, history happens. Um, so that is why the cock. The to make a long story short, that's why the prevalence of uh, lactose tolerance uh, intolerance is so low among Caucasians because of this early mutation among Indo-Europeans. And you know, Arabs are considered Caucasian as well. And even in the Arab societies, there was a, this was independent of the Indo-Europeans. There was a tolerance that developed to lactose and that was more for camel milk. So two, the same mutation happened in two different societies and it arose in the other populations as well. That's why it's not 100% intolerance in those other populations, but particularly in the case of the Indo-Europeans, it was such a huge survival advantage because they could move into the plains and you know, survive off of their cows and their goats and all that stuff um, that the prevalence is so low these days. All right, and that's it. That is the last of the uh, carbohydrate metabolism.